ship, allowing the Macon to swing like a weather vane until she was heading into the wind. An electric device in the control car indicated to the captain that the ship was still heavy forward, supported by the nose to the top of the mooring mast. We saw an, ad an enlisted van operating an automatic dial telephone receiving reports from 14 different stations in this huge ship. Water ballast was dropped by means of wire toggles operated in the control car, and we could see the wa water fall out of the ship, sometimes from a way back aft, sometimes from forward, and again from a midship. We could hear reports coming in, 300 pounds heavy aft, 500 pounds heavy forward, and then equilibrium aft, equilibrium forward, and finally 1,000 pounds light forward, and 800 pounds light aft, which we were informed meant that we were about ready to let go. And then a deep silence prevailed with only the captain speaking occasionally, and that in almost an undertone. He called to an officer on the ground, stand by to let go, and then up ship. There was a great thrill. We felt a slight jar when the airship's nose was released from the mast, and we saw the ship begin to rise very slowly. Same sensation as an elevator starting up. The captain almost whispered four engines up two-thirds. We, we could hear the engine start and the hum of the propellers. Then the ship began to rise very rapidly with the ground falling away directly under us. The remarkable thing is we rose absolutely vertically with neither headway nor sternway until we were about 300 feet above the mooring mast. Four engines ahead standard was the next order, and we could hear those engines now start. It was at least uh, a half a minute before we noticed the ground start to move astern, and the ship leisurely picked up ground speed. It's still climbing because of four engines which were pushing the ship up, while the four remaining engines were propelling us ahead. Stop the up engines. Shift to eight engines ahead standard. The sharp rumble of the up engine ceased. We could barely hear the distant propellers. The gentle swish of air at the open window informed us that we were gliding through the air. Then we were surprised to learn that we were moving at more than 50 miles an hour. And we missed the engine roar and the vibration which we have always associated with flying in an airplane. We were surprised to learn that we could whisper to each other and be heard. We were fascinated by the thought that this grand ship, nearly 800 feet long and 133 feet in diameter, was actually aloft and swimming through the oceanic air like a huge whale and in almost complete silence. We could hear low-voiced orders from the control cabin 20 feet away, rising one meter per second. Altitude, 500 feet. Level off at 1,000 feet. Altitude, 1,000 feet, sir. Each order was meticulously repeated, exactly as given. Other than that, no one spoke. And we realized that we were on a Navy ship, operated by a Navy crew, just as on any battleship or cruiser or destroyer. Then, we had the privilege of being invited to, into the control car. We hastened to accept that invitation as we were very eager to learn how an airship is flown. The control car itself is at the forward end of the cabin, built under the ship about 150 feet from the nose, and that's the spot where we began this broadcast today. We could see only three persons there, one enlisted man operating a steering wheel with the compass, just as on any surface ship, looking through salon windows under the ship's hull dead ahead. On the left or port side of the control car, we saw another enlisted man operating the elevators, which are the horizontal rudders located at the stern of the ship, pivoted at the after ends of the two horizontal fins. We noticed as the elevator man turned the wheel one way, the ship's nose seemed to rise, and when he reversed the wheel, the nose dropped. And this man was just about the busiest human being we've seen in years. He was spinning that wheel first one way and then the other, always marvelously alert, watching the several altimeters to show our height above the water, watching a long glass tube, near which there was an air bubble just exactly like that in a carpenter's level. And we, just, we found out that this instrument is called an inclinometer, and the position of the bubble shows that the ship is on an even keel, or that the nose is up, or the nose is down, and it's all measurable in degrees on the scale. He was also watching another instrument called the variometer, a glass tube like a thermometer placed at an angle, the tube half full of what, as far as we know, might be red ink. A scale alongside this tube shows the elevator man, as he is known, whether the ship is steady in altitude or whether the ship is rising or falling in space. And not only that, it tells one how fast you are rising or falling. 
He's also watching the nose of the ship all the time, spinning his wheel first one way and then the other. We could easily imagine that the horizontal rudders must be waving up and down about like a fish's tail. The third man in the control car was an officer, the officer of the deck on watch in charge of the ship. That control car has many strange-looking instruments and knobs and gadgets. There are four big double dials on one side, which are called engine telegraphs, used to transmit orders to the eight engines. Each engine dial has a space for idle ahead, ahead one-third, ahead two-thirds, ahead standard, ahead full speed, idle astern, astern one-third, astern two-thirds, astern full speed, cut water recovery in or out, normal propeller or propeller tilted, in which case the propeller blades rotate in a horizontal plane instead of a normal vertical plane. Since the engines can be reversed and the propellers can be tilted, it is possible on this airship to drive the ship ahead or to back down and also to push the ship up vertically or pull it down vertically. In other words, this, this ship can go straight up or straight down. Other instruments in the control car are helium control valves by means of which helium lifting gas can be valved from the ship to reduce any excessive buoyancy or lightness. However, valving helium is done very rarely because the valve gas is lost to the atmosphere. Another instrument board is the ballast board, by means of which water ballast may be dropped from any point on the airship. Uh, by the way, some gasoline tanks are also connected to this board to permit gasoline to be jettisoned in cases of great emergency. Instruments are also installed to show air speed and to record air distance traveled. A telephone is installed in the control car, connecting all the major stations in the ship. The officer of the deck is busily engaged in overseeing the rudder man and elevator man, watching all the instruments and recording the ship's progress in the official log. In a separate room, just back of the control car, where we had our microphone a moment ago, we meet another officer on watch known as a pilot, or the navigator on watch. This officer plots the ship's position, directs the courses to be steered, assisting the officer of the deck as required in flying the ship, and carrying out the mission of that particular flight. During flight, approximately one half of the crew are on watch and various duties in the ship, running the engines, watching the gas cells, pumping gasoline fuel as required, pumping water ballast as, as needed. Two radio men are also constantly on watch, as two different messages can be sent. Instruments are also installed to show air speed and to record air distance traveled. A telephone is installed in the control car, connecting all the major stations in the ship. The officer of the deck is busily engaged in overseeing the rudder man and elevator man, watching all the instruments and recording the ship's progress in the official log. In a separate room, just back of the control car, where we had our microphone a moment ago, we meet another officer on watch known as a pilot, or the navigator on watch. This officer plots the ship's position, directs the courses to be steered, assisting the officer of the deck as required in flying the ship, and carrying out the mission of that particular flight. During flight, approximately one half of the crew are on watch and various duties in the ship, running the engines, watching the gas cells, pumping gasoline fuel as required, pumping water ballast as, as needed. Two radio men are also constantly on watch, as two different messages can be sent or received simultaneously. One man is on watch running the airship's generators to provide current for lighting, radio and fuel pumps, telephones, and so on. Incidentally, the telephone system aboard uh, the Macon is uh, very convenient. It's a uh, complete dial automatic telephone system. Uh, one of two Navy cooks is always on watch preparing three hot meals per day for the crew and officers. Comfortable mess halls are provided in the middle of the ship for the crew to take turns at meals. The uh, atmosphere on board is that of any Navy ship at sea on routine cruising. An airplane compartment is built completely inside this airship. Airplanes are hooked on in flight and brought inside the ship for storage or unloading of passengers. Five airplanes may be carried, and these planes are used to transport men to the ground or from the ground to the ship. Not a dream, but a daily fact available at any time of the flight, whether it is daytime or nighttime. And now we have a few minutes. We're going to take a little journey up into the hull of the ship itself. We're leaving the, the gun room as it is known, going up the hatch into the hull, climbing the ladder. There's quite a breeze as we go up. And now we'll close the hatchway. There we are. We're now in the, uh, in the uh, center gangway, and straight ahead, uh, there's a catwalk and steps up to the nose of the Macon. On the left-hand side is the radio control room as we go up a few steps, and an officer's room on the right-hand side. And here we are, the aerial office, uh, aerological officer, on the right-hand side, the executive officer. A few steps forward, the radio compass, and on the right-hand side, the captain's cabin. And here uh, we find the berths which 
sure sufficed for us so comfortably last evening. Now returning back to the crosswise uh, catwalk and down a few steps. You can hear that uh, the whistle of the sonic altimeter. The uh, officer, the navigation officer, is testing for uh, altitude. We're going up the catwalk, up to the side of the ship now. Uh, on either side of us, our helium bags, they're known aboard as gas cells. This catwalk is about 10 or 11 inches wide, and uh, it requires a, quite a bit of time to become accustomed to walking on it. But we're getting there bit by bit. Now we're at the top of the crosswise catwalk and uh, standing on the catwalk which runs along the starboard side of the ship the entire length. Uh, members of the crew are uh, walking up and down on inspection duty. And uh, on the right hand side there are three gas tanks which, with the center tank being the slip tank, tank that can be cut away in case of emergency. Down that's the washroom and uh, the uh, Ward room, which is the officer's mess hall and the galley, where the cooks are busily preparing luncheon. Now we'll uh, head back downward, down these rather precarious steps, which I hope will not give way right at this particular moment. I can only hold on with one hand. If you uh, hear a sound as I go along, that's my hand rubbing along the, the gas cells as we descend on this catwalk. Incidentally, every man aboard is wearing tennis shoes or rubber-soled shoes to prevent slipping or to uh, uh, prevent the possibility of any sparks from nails in the soles of their shoes. And now, hatchway opened again, and we're descending back into the gunner's cabin, just uh, back of the navigator's control room. Now we'll let Harrison Holloway say a few words to you just as soon as he gets down the hatch to my side. I haven't anything more to say, Paul, before we sign off, except that having walked that catwalk to dinner every night, I know now that I'm going to walk around the corners of the apartment house every night to get up an appetite. And now, our program will be concluded from the studios of KHJ down in Los Angeles. Uh, we're almost over the city of Los Angeles right now, and uh, we'll turn you back to Raymond Page and his orchestra. Take it away, KHJ. <laughs>